Hi, Dr. Patrick Gentempo here, back with you again. We are in the studio again. Even though the whole set has been broken down, we have more to give you, and we're really excited to bring this to you. So, enjoy. When you're looking at the messages and, and uh, communicating, because there's really two dimensions of it. One is that you'll speak to other pastors, right? and kind of organize and have your communications. And then of course, it's the pastor speaking to the, the lay public. So um, what is, uh, how do you see as far as when you're um, communicating with other pastors, hmm. what's the, the most important conversations that you think you have there? And then when you're speaking to the public, what do you think are the most important conversations? Well, the pastors, the dilemma for the pastors is they need up-to-date good information to communicate to the people in the pew. Mm -hmm. And we try to give them that. We try to educate them or at least point them in the right direction. They often don't have a lot of time to accumulate a full body of knowledge unless they're reading 24 seven. Right. And oftentimes with their counseling demands, their preaching schedule um, and so forth that they don't have a chance to do that. What we like to do is come alongside, equip them, fill in the gaps. Mm -hmm and give them the most up-to-date information that can support what they do, whether it's teaching the Word of God on Sunday, whether it's counseling, whether it's taking an Israel trip mm -hmm. and communicating the interesting information to their people. So I think to the pastors, it's more of encouraging and helping them achieve what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. As far as the public is concerned, we want to get them the raw information in order to evangelize and share the faith mm -hmm. and defend the faith. Yeah. And sometimes it will not come through the pulpit mm -hmm. at church, and most of the times it doesn't. They have to do extra reading or go to school, and that's what we do. We want to equip with popular literature, with popular lectures so they can understand them without the technical jargon that goes along with some of these things sometimes, so they can easily have something that they can use in the field. So it's very practical. Do you feel culturally now defending the faith, uh, the need to is escalating or is it de-escalating or is it kind of status quo? How, what are you seeing as far as the trend there? Well, defending the faith is gonna become more needed as time goes on. In fact, some pastors that didn't even wanna to touch the subject mm -hmm. are now realizing that they're gonna be forced to mm -hmm. because we got a billion and a half Muslims on the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, you have planes, trains, and automobiles. The world is uh, increasingly becoming one. Mm -hmm. And these cultures that were distant uh, lands in the, in the days past are now people you're sitting next to on the airplane or the train or in the taxi right. or working with. Right. Um, business has, has really unified over the years. The world is increasingly coming together in everything they do. And unless we step up and unless we equip ourselves to be able to share the faith in these alternative cultures, then Christianity will not be effective. Mm -hmm. We will basically be relegated to quoting Bible verses, and then when they disagree or give pushback, we'll have to tuck that Bible under our arm and go somewhere else. Mm. So pastors are realizing this, the laity is realizing this, and hopefully we can begin to take ground back because the world is coming to us now. As we look at evidence, um, over the past, let's say, 100 or so years, what do you think some of the most important archaeological evidence uh, is that has emerged? Well, that's a great question because at the turn of the 19th century, the liberal critics were hammering Bible-believing Christians about not having the original accurate biblical text mm -hmm. because our earliest manuscript was at least a thousand years removed. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the original writings and so forth. Well, that all changed at the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. When they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947 in those caves in Qumran, right at the shores of the Dead Sea, that all changed because the documents they found there were of every book of the Hebrew Old Testament except the book of Esther. Mm -hmm. And what they found was was that these documents are essentially the same. In fact, they said 95% identical to our Old Testament we read today. What about the 5% differences? Well, there was spelling mistakes, word order reversals, minor trivial things that don't affect any major doctrine or meaning of the text for the most part. Mm -hmm. 
that was probably the most important discovery in the last 100 years. And uh, so does that become a foundation from which other discoveries are kind of built or other extrapolations are made about uh, you know, the, uh, you know, the accuracy of the Bible? Yes, actually the Dead Sea Scrolls also tell us that the Bible was copied accurate. Mm. Because if you take and look, there is an unbroken chain or witness of the biblical text. In fact, the earliest biblical text we have today is called the Ketif Hinnom mm. Silver Scroll. Mm -hmm. It's a little portion of Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. It's the Aaronic benediction. Mm -hmm. May the Lord bless thee, may he keep thee, and make his face to shine upon thee. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls at about 300 BC at their earliest dates, you take 600 BC, the Ketif Hinnom Silver Scroll, you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls at 300 BC, and then you look at the various documents later than that, you find there's an unbroken chain and there is an accuracy of transmission of the text. In fact, most scholars uh, today, and even the great late uh, Princetonian scholar Bruce Metzger said, it's 95 to 99 percent plus accurately transcribed over the years. We are sure we have the original Bible. Wow. So, and uh, it's with reference to other types of historic documents, I mean, uh, is this unusual for there to be this much uh, validation? It is unusual mm -hmm. because if you compare, let's say, a dozen works from ancient history, Herodotus, Thucydides, mm -hmm. Plato, Aristotle, even Homer's Iliad, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be the second most supported uh, document from the ancient world, mm -hmm pales in light of what we have to support the scriptures. In fact, the New Testament alone has some 25,000 plus manuscripts in all languages, including Greek, that attest to its accurate reconstruction. Can you describe uh, the process of, you know, how all these different um, evolutions and transcriptions, you know, occurred over time uh, of the Bible? and? Um, and maybe speak to, with all that, the likelihood of fidelity probably, you know, you'd speculate would be low, but yet the evidence is that it's very accurate. So, so how did this emerge uh, and, and why is it profound? Well, the Bible's copying process, which we call transmission, mm -hmm. occurred from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you look to the Old Testament, you had groups of scribes copying word for word and they took their job seriously because they knew they were copying the Word of God. And when they knew that, they made every detail, every jot, every tittle, the smallest mark they took care and concern for. And they did this for thousands of years. Wow. And so when we see manuscripts of the Scripture today, especially the Old Testament, we find that there is really no difference from our English Bibles today than what we see in these Hebrew Old Testament manuscripts. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's some spelling mistakes and some word order reversals and so forth, but minor trivial changes that are essentially the same meaning as what we see today in the scriptures. When we talk about the New Testament, we have the same thing going on because it's largely the church copying the scriptures over and over through the centuries. And what we find is no matter what manuscript we look at, it doesn't matter where it comes from, it has the same message. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when we compare all these manuscripts that support our English Bible, mm -hmm. we find that there is no substantial difference between the manuscripts and what we're reading today on church on Sundays. So it's just a marvelous testimony to God's providential care of His Word through the centuries. And I heard you comment on uh, some of the transcribers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, so uh, you know, can you repeat that? Well, you know, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were beginning to be uh, analyzed and, and translated and so forth, the scholars got bored doing it because it was essentially the very same thing that we have in our English Bibles today. There was no substantial difference. Yes, there are some word issues and some interesting philological uh, nuggets there for the scholars, but you found that most of them started to peter out, quit, and go find something else to do. It was so boring because it was essentially the same thing we already have in our Bibles today. And that effectively answered the liberal critics mm -hmm. 
who charged that we did not have the original text. In fact, we probably had a collection of myths and legends. So for you personally, um, you know, and, and obviously you've knew, known about this, how important were some of these foundations to say that, okay, we've got more current world validation of the uh, premise that this is, you know, the text that we have today reflects the text that you know, existed, you know, all these years ago. And how important was that piece of the puzzle, uh, you know, in your own Christianity, in your own, you know, the, the way that you kind of embraced it? How critical is that evidence for you to be able to, to have the conviction that you have today? You know, evidence by nature is something that has to be analyzed by people. Mm -hmm. Their interpretive skills has to come to bear on whatever artifact or manuscript they're looking at. But as far as the evidence is concerned for me, it simply validates the decision I've made to follow Christ. Mm -hmm. It validates the theology of Scripture. It validates the fact that we have a Bible that was written right from the hand of the apostle or the prophet himself. In other words, it means a lot to me and to the church at large that what they're believing is true mm -hmm. and it's based in reality. There are so many real religions that can be based on myth or based on a certain philosophy, but Christianity has been said to be the historic Christian faith for a reason, because it's rooted in reality. And to have your feet rooted in reality is very important when you come to spiritual and religious things because, you know, religious things can be nutty sometimes. And you want to make sure that you've got your feet on the ground along with your heart and your head in heaven as well. That's it for this particular interview. Thanks for joining me. Really excited to take this ongoing journey with you as we keep bringing more content. If you haven't already, you really should subscribe to this channel. There's a lot of phenomenal content coming down the road into the future that you'll want to know about. Leave a comment down here. I think people would love to hear from you and then you can hear from them too. If you liked it, go ahead and give a like. It only takes half a second and share this with people that you care about. The world needs more light in it right now. So thanks for being with me. Hope to connect with you again soon.